10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello and welcome back to the Dream Team podcast. Uh, we've finished up with round nine after an absolutely frantic match last night between Manly and the Roosters. I'm Jay and uh, I'm here with uh, Nathan Banksy. Banksy, good to have you again, mate. How'd you fare this weekend? I feared pretty well this weekend. wasn't too bad off the pitch. On the pitch, a nice 900 flat. Saw me raised to 342nd overall. Nice work, mate. Well done. And uh, you got me this week, mate. I, I picked up an 892. And uh, believe it or not, I, I never saw the day when an 890 would see me drop. But it did drop me 10 places back to 118th. just shows you how competitive and how close you fought that top um, echelon is in Dream Team. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, uh, I think last week I worked out, and I may have mentioned it, there's only 50 points separating um, top sort of 200 to 250 uh, players, which is, is just phenomenal. You know, that, that can completely flip on its head um, in a game, in one round. Uh, the top yeah. 10, of course, are, are a little further ahead than that, but that's a, that's a whole other story there. They're a league unto their own at the moment, the Gangbusters. And Mentors has uh, 50% of the top 10 are, are Mentors players. So well done, guys. Well done all round to, to Mentors. Golf clap. Golf clap. Love it. Beautiful. All right. So uh, what are we going to do on the show today, Banksy? What's what's our first up off the first cap off the rank, mate? Well, I believe you're going to do a very quick run through, very quick recap of the team lists that have been announced today. We're going to move on to these knee-jerk reactions where you are going to share a story about yourself that you did last night. And then we're going to go on to something that maybe you might not have thought about, and that's reverse cash cows. More to be explained later. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for that one. Just dobbing me in and, and throwing me in the middle of it after my little uh, anxiety panic attack last night. Oh, you came to me when he was on 10 points. Yeah, all right. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's not get into it now. We'll, we'll get into it later so that we keep the good stuff for, uh, for in the show. If we, if we reveal it all now, mate, everyone will just switch off. I wonder if people can guess who it is. <laughs> if I had a prize to give away or we had some sort of sponsor, I'd, I'd throw that up if you could guess. But uh, being it's not a live show, sucked in. And also we don't have sponsors sucked into us. But uh, if you're ready, Banksy, mate, I will do a lightning round of team lists. You up for it? I'm up for it. Excellent. All right, ladies and gentlemen, bear with me. First up, Friday night, we've got Broncos versus Titans. Jordan Carhu stays on the wing. Ben Hunt moves into the number six jersey in place of Scotty Prince. And Josh McGuire into the eight jersey in place of Ben Hannett. Mitchell Dodds comes in as 18th man on the bench. Bench reading David Stagg back from injury. Scott Anderson, David Heller, Jared Wallace. For the Titans, Matty Schrama is named in the 17, but Sam Irwin named on the bench to cover him because we're not 100% sure that he's right to go. Um but looking like a very full-strength Titan side. Ben Ridge injured his, re-injured his peck earlier on, uh, playing for Tweed in uh, Queensland Cup, New South Wales Cup. Uh, Mark Milicello keeps his spot in the 12, though I doubt he's keeping his spot in most dream teams. Mark Ione also named an 18th man on the bench, so just keep an eye for any late changes there. Moving on, Rabbitohs versus West Tigers, also Friday night match. Um, not too many changes happening for the Rabbitohs. Dylan Farrell, Jeff Lehman named at 18th, 19th man. Uh, West Tigers, once again, it looks like Mick Potter's just thrown in all the team names into a blender and is looking at what gets spat out and just mixing and matching. We've got Tim Simona again at the number four. Uh, Suseo Sue starting at prop in the number 10. Bodine Thompson starts in second row at number 11. You've got Adam Blair at the 12, Eddie Pettiborn at starting at lock. Benji Marshall, hello, my name is Benji Marshall, is coming off the bench at 14. Don't know if that's going to stay the same. Keep an eye on team lists. Ben Murdoch Masala drops to 18th man. Uh, Dragons versus the Eels. Josh Dugan makes his comeback after disgracing himself on social media uh, with photos of a cruiser drinking on the roof. Apparently he said some bad things as well, but we all know what the real reason is, and that's his drink drinks. No B and League ever wants to be caught out doing that. No club wants to associate with a player who does. Uh, major changes in that side of front, side from the Josh Dugan re-entry. Uh, there are none, though. Cameron King is 18th man. Just keep an eye on those teamless as well. Over at the Eels, Appy Periferangi stays in the number three jersey. Uh, Ryan Morgan may come in for him, as we know that that's uh, Morgan he's there replacing. Again, keep an eye on teamless. 
uh, Luke Kelly in the six, Chris Sando in the seven, um, Fui Fui Moi Moi and Tim Manor starting props. Kalipi Tanganoa in 12. He had a fantastic game last week and he's, he's proving to be a cash cow. You heard it here first on Dream Team. Remember, guys, a few weeks back we uh, we wrapped him hard. Penny Taripo, uh, not the, the big sort of gangbuster start we were hoping for last week, but keep an eye on him. Kid with plenty of talent. Interchange bench, Casa Pritchard may actually get some game time. There's no 18th man named for the Eels, so it looks like he's going to get to finally get on the ground. Moving on to the Panthers, uh, Lewis Brown. Uh, hold up there. Yeah, backing up. Yep. You, there's also a debutante in Junior Polo this week as well. Ah, that's I'm right. I'm pretty sure. Yep. I'm no, pretty you're, sure it's Junior. Yeah, you're dead on. You're dead on. On that interchange bench for the Eels, just be very, very careful when you're having a look. You've got Junior Polo and Joseph Polo, so make sure you're getting your polos right. Um, Ricky Stewart says next week he's looking to blood a new player that nobody's ever heard of called Marco. But Moving on, Panthers v Warriors. You've got Lewis Brown in at uh, the number three, Dean Farre at number four. Isaac John had a pretty good debut in the number six, so keep an eye on him. Um, 17 named, so Seguiaro Anderson, who is a nice little front row, second row potential cash cow. Scored 22 last week, I believe. He's in at the 15, coming off the bench. Mose Masso and Clint Newton. Over at the Warriors, Glenn Fisiahi uh, scored okay, about a 22 at fullback. Just keep an eye on him and keep uh, an ear to the ground for Kevin Locke's injury because we don't know how long Fisiahi's going to be there. Carlos Tua Mavave is in at the centres. No Conrad Hirrell still. Uh, which seems to be a, a, I don't know, nobody really knows what's going on there and why Herald's not playing. I believe he's named for the Vulcans this week. So it's something's going on. Coach Matty Elliott is uh, is once again rolling the dice or consulting voodoo magic. We, we really don't know. 18th man is um, Matt, Matt and, uh, Banksy. 18th man for the Warriors? Matange. Matange. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh, Okay, so Cowboys, Roosters, no real major changes. Winnerstein named at five, of course, this year. He's been named at five just about every game and uh, has, has dropped off at the last minute. So just keep an eye on those team lists. As we say it, I know I'm repeating myself, but we say it every single week, so just make sure you keep an eye on those team lists before the game. Um, Jared Waria Hargraves, named for the Roosters at eight, despite the fact that he could be facing a five to seven week suspension. So keep your ear to the ground, look at the news, NRL United, news on Facebook or wherever you go for your news, just to find out exactly what the Roosters decide to go with Maria Hargraves. Um, he could contest and get off and be right to play. If he doesn't, who's going to come in with Sam Mauer injured um, for the for Jared Banksy? Who's your pick, mate? It could be that youngster, the under-20 superstar from last year, Kane Evans. Yeah. Or it could be Lau, uh, Le, uh, Louis, I think. But Is it uh, Isaac uh, Lyo or something like that? Lyo. Yeah, yeah, but I think he's got he's injured because he's got a nice injury tag next to him in Dream Team. Yeah, it could be that that just hasn't been updated. So again, guys, that's one to, to make sure you're doing your research, keeping on ear to the ground, and checking team lists. Moving on, Sharks v Raiders. Uh, Fecky is keeping a spot on the wing at the moment. Looks like he may have replaced Stapleton and, and sort of leapfrogged the, uh, the the pecking order there. Um, John o Wright in at the centres now. Banksy, you're telling me Wright should score sort of 20 to 25 in at the centres. He's he's not a bad pick up there. Should score about 20 to 30, I think. If he goes back to the wing, he'll go back to the zeros to tens. Okay, fair call, and good to know. Uh, Mark Tafua named 18th man. Sam Take It Easy Tag It Easy is 15th, and uh, I bet he's sucking in a few coaches this year because he's actually getting a bit of game time. I right. He has, he's gone up. <laughs> he has, he's, he's Seven, gone up. 7.6% of teams own him. Oh, That's God. That's a 2.7% change this season. Yep, and uh, as we approach, sort of, I, I suspect about round 15, we're going to see an increase in suicides amongst Dream Team coaches. Moving on, before uh, Cruiser decides to sponsor me and I lose my contract with the Canberra Raiders. Uh, speaking of which, Canberra Raiders, Blake Ferguson looks to be playing for uh, a New South Wales Blue, uh, Blues jersey, so expect a couple of good games from him coming up. He does send a string a couple together sometime or, or around about this time every year. Um, definitely not a long-term prospect for my money. I, I honestly think he's a little bit overrated, but that's just me personally. Uh, Josh Papali is back, and uh, he was back last week, had a really good game apparently. Look, I, I really dislike that because Josh and I go way back to the beginning of the year when he screwed me over. Uh, Sean Berrigan named 18th man. Anthony Milford at 14. Joe Picker, Dane Tills, Paul Vaughan. Um, Paul Vaughan and, of course, Joe Picker. Looked like a two pickups happening there. Moving on, Knights, Bulldogs. Uh, interestingly, Chris Houston and Tamana Tahu dropped from the Knights. 
Uh, Joey Leilua comes into the number four for Tamana Tahu, and David Fayalongo is uh, starting lock in place of Chris Houston. Um, no sort of word as to why that's happened as yet, but the interesting thing is it means that Corbin Sims is named in the 17, as is Neville Costigan, so we're unlikely to see Costigan drop off the bench in favour of Sims. Uh, across now to look at the Bulldogs, Kristen Inu makes his way back from suspension. Ben Barber scored 40 last week. Could this be the sign that we've all been uh, waiting for, that perhaps he's bottomed out and he's, he's about to hit form again? I'm not really sure, but hey, I'm not going to take the risk. I'm jumping on him this week, and, and I suspect a lot of other coaches are as well. Extended bench name by Desi Hasler. Hey, why break a pattern, Desi? Martin Tapau and Tim Brown named 20th and 21st men. Um, Hellertail, Jackson, Graham, Finnecane is the bench there and no other major changes that I can pick up. Uh, Hodkinson keeps his spot at seven, which is good for everyone who's jumped on in this far and made a good 50 plus thousand or 70,000, I think, for some of them. Uh, Storm versus Seagulls, final round of the match. Um, sorry, final match of the round. <laughs> Spoonerism's greatness. Uh, let's have a quick look here. Laggy Sedu named 18th man. Slade Griffin named in the 17. Morris Blair, who will now play his third game. Uh, he's named at 16. Tohu Harris starting lock again, Ryan Hoffman 12, Proctor 11. So pretty much as it has been for the last couple of weeks, moving across the Seagulls, Peter Hicku, who did an all right job at the back there replacing um, Snake. Uh, what's Snake's real name, Banksy? I've just had a mental blank. It is called Brett Stewart. That's the man, Brett the Snake Stewart. Uh, so Peter Hickey's doing an all right job there. George Tafua, Jamie Lyon, Steve Maddai, who scored a minus four. The guy scored a try and still managed to get negative numbers. Well done, Maddai. Um, Brenton Lawrence, interestingly, he is looking like an absolute gun. We've been telling you to get on Brenton Lawrence. I personally have a little bit of a man No, I'm, I'm lying. It's, it's borderline stalkerish man crush on him. Um, he is absolutely going gangbusters. But Jason King has elected to have season-ending shoulder surgery, meaning that Brenton Lawrence becomes numero uno in the prop pecking order over at Manly. So it couldn't see increased minutes um, and increased responsibility for Brenton Lawrence. And the way he's been playing lately, well, why not? I mean, you see, they were joking on Channel 9, uh, sorry, not Channel 9, on Fox Sports last night, that if one of the wingers went down, they'd just move Brenton Lawrence out to the wing. So he's got that turn of pace. And the line breaks have shown that. Uh, Dave Gower comes onto the bench. Tom Simon's pull was a late admission or late pullout uh, last or last night um, in, in the previous round with a quad injury. So make sure you do watch the uh, the team list closer to time. Jamie Bure, George Rose, James Hassan named 18th man. Uh, he'll be there to cover Tom Simon's uh, if if Simon's cannot complete. And that's our team list in record time, Banksy. I bet you he probably won't be because Jeff Tevy loves bringing in extra players that he hasn't named onto the bench. Yes, well, this is this is very true. Um, but, you know, such is life. We can only go with the information they give us, uh, you know, at this point in time. Definitely. Okay. So, what's next, Banksy? We just got through teamless in record time, and to be honest with you, I'm going to let you tell us all what's next while I have a drink because that took a bit of gas. Yep. Yeah, I thought I'd better take over the hosting for a little bit as you recover from that speed burst you did. We're oh, going to move mate. on to knee-jerk reactions. And this was exemplified last night when Jay himself came to me and he had a big knee-jerk reaction. He had a freak out that when he scored, saw Maloney was on 10 points, he said, I'm going to trade Maloney for Sutton. And I decided to tell him why he shouldn't, but I'm going to let you tell him why. In, in, in all fairness, in all fairness, Banksy, let's, let's put this in context here. I come to you with a thousand trades a week, right? Because that's 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 the way my mind works. I'm I'm hyper analytical in a lot of ways, and and look, there's probably all sorts of anxiety disorders and shit like that that they haven't diagnosed me with yet, mainly because they don't have the medication to keep me under wraps. And if they ever discovered, I'd probably have to be put out of room. But that being said, I do come to you every single week with, I mean, how many trades have we discussed today alone? For your team, we've discussed about 20 different options. Exactly. Now, in that, I've also managed to do a little bit of work, just a little bit of work today. Um, I've been to various meetings. I've played sport this evening and, and done all sorts of other bits and pieces, and we've still managed to discuss 20 trades. So just putting in context, I do come to you with a whole lot of different trades all day, every day. Is that correct? You do. Excellent. That is correct. Now... To put to put this in, just just wanted to to make me sound a little bit less like a uh, a psychotic girlfriend here, really, um, who just found out that you'd been texted from your mother that she said I love you, and she's like, who the hell is this? But anyway, moving right along. So James Maloney was on a really terrible score, terrible score at halftime, 
and I'd been considering, and then, you know, like most mentors, there's, there's been a fair bit of discussion uh, about the possibility of John Sutton playing Origin, um, his viability as, as a potential half for Dream Team coaches, particularly over buy rounds, being that the Rabbitohs have some nice buys, um, and, and what those, you know, what the potential options are, what can we play with, what can we do, and should we be bringing John Sutton in? And a number of coaches have said, look, he's a, he's a really good buy. He's looking the goods. He's playing very, very well. You know, in the last sort of 10 rounds of 2012, he was like the second or third best averaging half in the game. And he's second, second yep. And, and he's, he's, he's having a gangbuster year. And if you take Origin out of the equation, you know, he, he seems like a really buy. You look at scores, he's very, very consistent. You know, he sort of goes between 40 and 60. And, and there's very few blips outside of that range, which is, I mean, that's a good range to have for a half. Um... So he looks like a really good buy. And the, the big problem that a lot of the coaches who I've been chatting with and, and have been chatting on mentors have had is they just don't have a way to fit him into their side. For example, the discussion that you and I were having even before James Maloney, you know, had his little uh, hissy fit against against the Seagulls last night was if I was to bring in Sutton, how would I do it in the way that best benefits my side and, and would it be a wise move? Now, my halves, I have Josh Reynolds, Trent Hodkinson, Albert Kelly and James Maloney. Four solid halves. Who would I trade? Well, James Maloney for John Sutton's a straight out, you know, no cash out of pocket trade. I'd have to find 80 grand this week to go Albert Kelly to John Sutton due to price drops. I'd have to find, um, I think it's about 60 grand, 50 grand to do Josh Reynolds. But I only brought in Josh... 55. So I only brought in Josh Reynolds. You know, I've had two scores for him, so I've had him two. And Trent Hodkinson, I'd need... You know, nearly 200. I need 198,000. So that's that's not really viable there. Plus, Hodko's got he's got a lot to go. Like his his break even this week, uh, from memory, is is minus 13. So it's minus 14. But 13, I, sorry. I, I did say from memory, but really I was looking at it right in front of me. I just want to sound good. I thought it was minus 14. Some is minus 14. I know that much. Yeah, there, there's a minus four and a minus 14 amongst it. Um, you know, so the options are James Maloney's got a break even at 63, and he's sort of he's fluctuating a lot more than what I feel comfortable with. like my strategy this year. My strategy has always been about nice, consistent scorers that I know are going to pump out a consistent score each week. And I, you know, Maloney he is a season keeper. He's just had a little bit of a flutter the last sort of couple of weeks. You know, he's gone from 26 to a or sorry, from a 70 to a 26 to a uh, 40 to a 36. Um, so, of course, at halftime, he's sitting on, I think it was sitting on 17 points or something like that, 16 points. Yeah, but it was less than that. It was it less was than 10. that. It was, it was 10. It was, so, he was sitting on 10 points, and I'm sitting there, I'm going, oh, God, you know, this is going to cost me. I'm, I'm going to drop back 300 places. I'm going to be out of touch with the, the leaders and everything like that. I've, I've got to do something. And, yeah, there was a little bit of panic setting in. I'm sitting there looking at the score going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And so, I've come to you, and I've said, I've got to get rid of Maloney. I've got to get rid of him. I've, I've, I've got to get rid of him. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go Maloney to Sutton. It'll, it'll be a, a straight cash for cash trade. And then you turned around and you said to me... What did I say? I said, is he injured? <laughs> you did. And uh, I said, no, he's just playing like... Beep. And... Um, he's missing tackles. He's, he's doing he, nothing. Yeah, he's missing tackles. He's doing nothing. You know, there, there weren't a lot of kick meters and things like that. Now, there's a couple of things, a couple of lessons to learn from this, this little story. Now... I want to preface it by saying I would never have made the trade after the updates showed that he made 36. You know, that's sort of the bottom. Like, if, if he'd been under 30 or, or, you know, even the low end of 30, I'd be seriously considering it. At 36, I'll cop that on the chin and just go, you know what, that's a bad week for Maloney. Um, so the first lesson there is don't ever panic until the updates are in. Because as we learnt over this weekend, it was very much a case of night in, night out, Go home stats, guys. You're drunk. You know, there were huge updates. We had players updating by 17 points in some cases. Um, you know, Maloney himself updated. I think he went from about 28 to 36. Uh, it, it was. So, you know, Robbie Rakow was one. He went from 30. He was at 36, I think, at the end of the game. And after updates hit 50. You know, Tahu Harris, another one, he was at 39 and ended up on 48 after updates. So... First and foremost, don't ever panic and, and go and, and, you know, make that decision in your head until after you've seen updates. So after that, you and I started having a discussion. And I started going, well, Sutton's better for buys, you know. And, and this is how I was trying to sell myself on it, was Sutton is better for buys. I should bring in Sutton. And you gave me some very good reasoning as to why I shouldn't do that. And I think in all fairness, Banksy, I should let you go back over and, and explain exactly what that reasoning was and what your line of thinking was. Because it was actually it was very, very rational, very, very mathematic in a lot of ways. Um, and very, very good. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of assumptions here. 
I'm assuming that you're going to keep Milani as a keeper, and if you trade in Sutton, you're going to keep Sutton as a keeper. So therefore, after this round, there is 15 games left for each team. And now, in this hypothesis, assuming Maloney and Sutton don't play Origin, both play 15 more games this season. If Maloney uh, Sutton scores more, Sutton's, Sutton's scoring an average of two points more than Maloney's, I believe. So over those 15 games, you're getting 30 more points. Is one trade worth 30 more points? If Maloney misses one game due to origin, okay, he makes 80 more points. Is it those 80 points worth that trade? And it's basically starting to think, is those two games you get from Sutton in the buys worth more than the normal points you get from Maloney in the normal rounds, where you can miss Sutton for round 13, for example, where you already have Kelly missing yeah. as well, so you force your hand with uh, Reynolds and Hodgkins. And, I mean, that's... Uh, you know that that's that is a very fair comment. Obviously, it gives me that extra player in that the round twelve I round. Um, but you no, know, I I do have limited trades. Limited trades. That. Yeah, and and that's that that's the dilemma that sort of comes up. Um, the interesting thing is Sutton does give me the, the extra player in the round fifteen buys. But Maloney already plays there anyway. Assuming does. no Origin. Assuming no Origin, right? And Sutton is also an outside chance of Origin. I mean, geez, he, he is the epitome of an Origin half. Really, he's tough as hell. Mm. I think he, he he will struggle to make Origin as a half, but he might make it on the bench. But in yeah. saying that, will they drop Gidley? Only if I I don't think they'll ever drop Gidley for some reason. I mean, if if he does get injured, yeah, that's why. That's that's the only way that they were, as you said. But I don't know. He's he's got the wood over the New South Wales selectors. I, I don't know if he's got incriminating photos or if they're just in love with him. You no, know, my my good mate Benny Schneider is he's got a bit of a man crush on at least so maybe he can shed some light on it. He's he's new mentors as well this week, guys. So maybe we could him up as to why you know Kirk Gidley always gets origin. Um, he, he might know. But aside from that, I've got no clue. I have no idea. Yeah, we we, we could pick a New South Wales team tonight and look at it again tomorrow and pick a different. 15 a different five players especially when it comes to the bench yeah absolutely absolutely so it's, it's, it's not a risk i think that's worth taking when you're only going to gain a few points here or there and if sudden does play origin and maloney doesn't which is probably going to be the case it'd be one or the other not both yeah maloney gets two more extra games on sudden therefore he makes up on those points and therefore you get extra 80 points from maloney well, that's right. I mean, if Sutton, the thing is, out of the two who play Origin, the better one for a Dream Team coach is only to play Origin. Because of eyes, whereas Sutton plays Origin, yep. because he plays in those small buy rounds, you don't just miss the normal buy round, you miss the small buy rounds when his team has the buy. So you do miss those extra games there. And and that's 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 something that, that I guess needs to be really taken into account. Um, it becomes similar to, it becomes similar to English he does, who misses mm. 12, 13 and 15. So he plays one game in four weeks. That's, and and that's, the same will go for McQueen too if he gets picked. And yeah, so any South player. So any South player, like and a South, South player who Tigers. goes... South and Tigers players who go to Origin. So Titans. this is... Oh, Titans, sorry. So South and Titans players who go to Origin, they miss round 12, they miss round 13 because of I. Both Titans and South have a buy in round 13. The Origin mm -hmm. players miss round 12. Then they miss, the Origin players miss round 15 as well because they're in camp again, despite the fact their teams play in that, that round. Yep. And then they miss round 18 as well. And they've got backup because issues coming out at 16 and 19. And they've got backup issues coming in at 16 and 19. So, you know, there's... There's a lot to take into account. It's it's not as straightforward. But thankfully, you know, with your uh, your dream team buy planner, Banksy, on the the team street team buy planner, and I have a better understanding of buys than I ever have. And uh, the strength in my side and the depth in my side is, you know, it's full credit to you being able to put that information in a manner that an idiot like me understands, mate. So thank you very much for that. Thank no worries. Uh, if, if I can say it, then it's idiot proof. It should be roughly. <laughs> Look, it, I, I certainly understand it. But um, so that was that was my little knee jerk reaction. You know, I really wanted to get rid of Maloney, and, and to be honest with you, I probably would have done today had I not have had uh, the the calm, rational mind of Banksy to, to talk to me in a way that that I understood. Um, I might have to start calling you the Jay Whisperer, Banksy. Just you make sense yeah. to me, mate. Makes sense to me. Yeah. I, 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 you, you, okay. I want to say this. You come to me with 20 trades this week. I've shot down about every single one of them, I think. Yeah, you do that with every trade I bring you anyway. And and the, the, the interesting thing, the litmus test is, if I'm willing to sit there and fight with you and argue with you, I know it's a good trade. Because if I can convince you that it's a good trade, then it's a good trade. And if I can bring them into my team as well, then yeah. it's a really good trade. <laughs> That's it. Everybody wins. Now, 
let's have a look at that. So that's that's the knee jerk reaction. That's a little, I guess, example, and we've had a bit of a chat and rambled on as as we typically do. A lot of dream team coaches are having this knee jerk reaction. Um, you know, some of it's justified, some of it's not so much. Let's have a look at knee jerk reactions, Banksy. What's what's one that that's been a popular one, mate? Where players are, are being actually, you know, who is just occurred to me, Brenton Lawrence. Yes. Brenton Lawrence knee jerk reaction a couple of rounds ago he had two bad rounds and we sat here and we discussed it and I believe at the time I said look don't stress every now and again he has a couple of bad games in a row and then he comes out and smashes some big ones and sure enough he, he had a, a 28 or something and a 30 something and then bam came back with a friggin 70 uh, here we go so he had a 38, a 29, came back with a 44 and so everyone sort of had a bit of a sigh of relief who hadn't traded him and then he went 71 for 8 so they, I mean, that's just Brendan Lawrence's pattern. He will, every now and again, he'll have a couple of quiet games. A lot of players who had jumped on Brendan Lawrence jumped off at that point. In fact, I believe it was about 10% um, of the players who had jumped on Brendan Lawrence jumped off and, and freaked out after he scored a 20. That was a knee-jerk reaction. You know, there was... There was no real reason. Like you, you can look at it and go, well, he got less minutes and Jason King's back and, and all these sorts of things. But there's a lot of stories we tell ourselves to justify that knee-jerk reaction so we don't feel like aid rage. Mm. And That's one thing. That's definitely one thing you've got to be careful too. Of you've got to, if you can, talk your thought processes through a trade, especially on mentors. If you talk through why you want to trade this player in or, and trade this player out and why you think it will benefit your team, I reckon more people will be more inclined to help you too. And you'll actually get probably you might get one or two people that will actually get in a good deep conversation that you do, and you'll find a person that you actually really like, and you'll start personal messaging messaging them, and they have a really good dream team relationship. Yeah, and that's I mean that's what's happened with you and me. Sure enough, we we do co-host the show and that from across the Tasman, but you and I sit there and and chat back and forth about it. Um, my my great mate actually a real life mate but he lives in a different state to me Saul he's he's just come into NRL bashes and it's his first season and he and I will start talking dream team because he's he's highly analytical like three of us you know we talk days Banksy I kid you not about dream team and he and I have three hour phone conversations late at night you know, about his side and and what to do with Steve Maddai or you know all these sorts so if you can develop that relationship and, and before before going and making that trade, that knee-jerk reaction trade, or you know, discuss it with your DT buddy. Wow, that sounds so cheesy, but discuss it with someone who you do have that relationship with, that you build that relationship, with, and get their thoughts on it. You don't have to agree with their thoughts, but just having another set of eyes, another sort of thought process, somebody on the outside looking in who can sit there and discuss it with you, that's invaluable. You know, you, you really tend to grow and learn a lot more from it and, and improve your thinking, but you also calm down and you start to look at it from a rational perspective and a long-term perspective. You know, quite often these knee-jerk reactions happen as a result of a short-term situation um, and that long gets... Mm, that's, that was, I was going to bring that point up. It's like, think about why that player is already in the team for and why that player you're trading in is going to come into your team as well. So if you have, say, a short-term cash card like a Sui, Sui that um, uh, Jay has himself, yep. he, if, he, if he wanted to trade him to Tarek Sim, say, uh, well, for example, let's say there's another cash card coming along, he might want to trade them out to him and not really good. That's actually a really bad example, sorry, I didn't think that through. Let's but look at Jack Buchanan. Yeah. Jack Buchanan's on yeah, my Buchanan. He's he's on my trade list. I'm I'm considering, you know, I've made one trade this week and, and that was to go Tao Tai to Barber. Um I'm considering whether or not I make another trade. You know, I've got the option of going Boyd to Gagai, but I'm thinking of holding off on that. I can go Buchanan to this new Sam Anderson. who's He's only played one game, but he looks like he's going to play a few coming off the bench for the Panthers. Scored about a 22 or something. There's a couple of benefits to him. In the, he's, he's front row forward, second row forward swapper. Um, and he's playing. Not good buys, but then again, he's got the same buys as Buchanan. So I'm not gaining or losing anything there. But I do gain the extra 100 grand. Now, Cannon, or 119, I should say. Cannon has a break-even of 31 this week, and he's coming off the bench against the Rabbitohs. I'm trying to weigh up, is Buchanan going to score well against the Rabbitohs, even coming off the bench? Or is now the time to get off him, take that money and just leave it sitting in the bank so that next week I can make a big upgrade and perhaps bring a Sam Burgess in or somebody that like and upgrade a, a Sui Aso Sui or something like that. Mm. That's one thing. Also, if you're thinking about, especially if you can trade, what trades do you think you need to do in the future? Say, I think that this player here is almost about topping out. I need to fix this. And for you, that's going to be that, that. That's Look at your team. That's Boyd. He's a pilot you need to sort out somehow. So there, there, there is probably one trade there next week. Okay, so you have one more trade to play with. But you also want to bring in Sam Burgess as well. Well, maybe you have to do a Buchanan trade this week, delay you to get Burgess next week. Well, and that's, as well as Boyd. 
that's that's exactly right because the thing with Gagai is he's going to drop. He had a, a, a rough round, and you know I'll be watching him closely because I'm not I'm not 100 percent sold on Gagai now. He is he does give me that good buy potential, particularly for round 12. But he also is that swapper, um, you know, between lean back position centers. Um, so I'm I'm looking at him from that angle. Now the, he's going to drop in price. Well, he'll either stay the same or drop him this week. Uh, his break evens for now. He's more than capable of scoring for. Don't get me wrong. He's capable of scoring 60s and 70s on his day. But at the moment, in the current run of form, plus up against the Bulldogs, 40 is going to be the upper echelon. In my opinion, what he's going to score. So I'm not in a huge rush. Having said that, is Darius Boyd going to lose money this week? Well, he's got a break even of 37. If he does, he'll lose four and a half grand, maybe, which is less than what Gagai will lose, in my opinion. Um, but I think Boyd has a better chance of scoring that 37 because he has sort of, you know, last week was a bad game for him. He's typically been scoring that mid anyone. anyway. Mm. If I That's bring in, you... sorry, I was, if, if I, next week, let's say that Gagai scores about a 20, okay, or a mid 20s, say 25, which is a score that at this point in time, I'll accept from you know, a wing flak or center, particularly one who's, who's as cheap as what Gagai is going to be. Now, if he scores a 21, he's going to drop 12 grand in price. That makes him 224,000. Okay, so let's let's just say we'll call it 226 round figures because I'm expecting a score mids. Mm -hmm. Boyd is going to be sitting at about that 250. Mm -hmm. I drop Boyd to Gagai, I pick up an extra 25 grand. Okay, I have 57,700 in the bank, so that gives me what, 80, 82,000 and, and change. Yep. I drop Buchanan, suddenly I have. Two hundred thousand dollars, like Buchanan to Anderson, and I've got two hundred grand sitting in the bank after making that Boyd to Gagai trade next week. Mm -hmm. Okay, assuming yeah. everything happens exactly as I've said it'll happen. Suiaso Sue has a break even of zero. He's expected to score about thirty three, and he'll go up in price by twenty thousand. That puts him at one hundred and ninety grand, mm -hmm. which gives me three hundred and ninety to play with. Should I then need it for Sam Burgess? Now. Sam Burgess is going to go up in price. Is going to go up in price. So I'm going to be a little bit short. It means that round 11 is not going to be the Sam Burgess round. I'm going to have mm -hmm. to find money elsewhere for that. Like I'm going to have to increase that sort of money in order to bring him in. But I also have Bodine Thompson sitting in that that sort of position. The other thing is I can sit there on Suiaso Su for another week, and he may gain another 20 grand. So in which case I can then make that trade, yep. you know, so it all comes down to sort of working out where you've got those trades to make. And that's sort of thing. having said all that, I think based on that and what we've just discussed, Buchanan to Anderson trade is the trade to go this week and to do it this week rather than risk yep. losing money on hand. Well, if you, if you don't do it this week, then you're definitely making sure you can't give them Burgess next week. If you do it yep. this week and your chips fall the right way, you can maybe get Burgess in this week, next week. I might, I might be able to fluke it, particularly if you know Sui Aso Su. He gets a try under his belt, suddenly scores a forty-five or something like that. You know, he picks up an extra yeah. five to ten grand. Maybe Boyd has a blinder and scores out of sixty or something. He actually goes up in price, and Gagai stays the same or drops a little expected. You know, there's there's all sorts of things there that could happen. Um, but, but then if you're saying that, then why would you not hold Boyd another week and wait on Gagai another week? That's the sort of thing too. Well, that's, that's something to consider. So you make the best decisions you can at the time with the information you have and give yourself best contingency plan, I guess, is, is the way to look at it so yep. that you know that next week, well, if that happens, you go this way. If something else happens, you go. Mm -hmm. Now, let's have, a look anyway. at, let's have a look at reverse cash cows, mate. You've mentioned a few of them what the, in your trade-ins. You've mentioned Barber yeah. and Gagai. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's a couple of really big names that I think we should focus on. Well, I mean, Barber's one of them, obviously, but there's there's one other. And we uh, we mentioned him tongue-in-cheek, Benji Marshall. Yes. I don't think Benji's ready this week. I think, well, he's got a break-even of, get my load quickly, he's got a break-even of 72 coming off the bench. You will hardly see him score another. He's got his minus 5-2 to hold in another game to put a score down to the 200k mark. He goes off the bench, he could score another 20, and therefore he could be really cheap again. He could be looking under 200 grand. He could be a, a potential cash-out option for a Cully after those buys, after wow. that round 12 buy. You bring in, you bring in Marsh, uh, Marshall, you get another 150K or whatever, 100 to 150K, and you have the same buy that, that's left in Cully, and you get an extra scoring player in round 13, and you get all that cash to spend as well. Wow. Can I just say, and, and look, I know that, you know, you and I talk a lot of Dream Team talk, and I know that this Benji Marshall reverse cash cow discussion has been popping up around the place. I hadn't paid it too much mind, perfectly honest, because his Tigers, his buyers aren't, you know, sort of in my in my thinking at this point in time with preparing for around, you know, the earlier buy rounds. But I didn't realise 
just how far he's dropped. And will continue to drop. And will continue to drop. He's 237,200 with a break even of 72. Don't jump on him this week, folks. Definitely don't. Like, I mean, he could score a 40, he could score a 50, and he's still going to drop in price. Yeah, but you also, another point I want to bring up in these reverse cash cow discussions is why are they scoring low for? Like, why did they score shit? And in Spinji's case, the round where he came, he injured himself in round six, round five, where he scored his first low score of 16. He scored a try, but he didn't really do much because he had a turf toe problem starting to flare up. So he missed yeah. a few tackles like he always does. He didn't do as much kicking. He's come back in the Bulldogs game, and he's missed a lot of tackles. He's had a few errors, and he's gone. His kicking meters have gone down, and he's lost his goal kicking as well because, and, obviously, his turf toe's playing up still. Yeah, and keep in mind that Bulldogs game, they got thrashed, what was it, 44 or something? 40 to 6 or something. Yeah. And then against the Sharks, he, he came back, and he scored slightly better. He fixed up his tackling a little bit. His errors were still there. He's, his kicking meters came back a little bit, but his attacking stacks weren't there, so he scored 21. He's off the bench this week. You would expect to see him get 60, 50 minutes sort of, sort of stuff. He's obviously, he's obviously not 100%, but they obviously want to use him because he's Benji Marshall, and he can flick it on to Flick it on for turn of a switch, he can. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I mean, look, this is this is definitely. I mean, this is huge. He he is a fantastic ca reverse cash cow. Um, as soon as Benji Marshall goes back to being Benji Marshall, there's there's a hundred and eighty thousand dollars to be made there. Maybe even two hundred thousand because suddenly, I mean, you look at the first scores he had. Um, in the first three rounds, 33, 75, 36. Now the 33 and the 36, yeah, that's about par for Benji Marshall. Um, you know, even at his, if, if he drops, well, we're expecting a fairly chunky drop, you know, another 35,000 drops. So let's say you pick him up at, at around the 200 mark and he starts going back to pumping out that 33 to 36 average. Um, you know, that's he, he's going to make you 100 grand. Now he throws in the occasional 75 for that, he's going to make you 150 grand. So... That's and, and that hundred and fifty grand, like for me, that hundred and fifty grand I dropped that into the Sui Arso Su equation, that's Sam Burgess and change. Definitely is. With with by the way, with the other trades that I was talking about. Yeah. There's one you gotta realise, like when does he come like Benji can average I think he averaged about fifty three, fifty four, fifty five last year, hence why he was priced at five hundred uh, four hundred K to start the year. Uh, he was he averaged fifty one point one seven in two thousand and twelve and fifty point seven zero in two thousand and eleven. Um, yep. Now two thousand and nine he was thirty seven point seven two thousand and ten thirty five point one seven. So old scoring system. Oh yeah, but the the averages have been updated um, and and their averages. I don't think the tackle busts have been added in and whatnot too. So uh, that. yeah, good. So we can assume let's let's just say for argument's sake he was forty point average in those those. Older years in 09 and 10, 2011 50 point, 2012 50 point. This is a guy who has a lot of skill. We know this. We we've seen Benji game in game out. We've seen you know him translate that. But the really key thing is that when Benji's on, it does translate to drink mm, It does. No, he's not one of these last players who's a superstar that doesn't translate well. In I think in last year he was averaging like two tackle, like try assist tackle, line break assist sort of stuff per game. He was setting up as well as his own scoring his own tries and doing his own line breaks and whatnot as well. Yeah. So he, he definitely has potential in him, but you just got to keep watching, wait for him to go back, kick back into gear. Yeah, and just watch it. Just, and and this, is, this is where assistant coach is worth 20 bucks a season because right now both Banksy and I all you know the repeated free trials and dodgy team setups and all that sort of stuff that <clears throat> others we know about may you but... Right now, I'm. My family out. wants to give me the login details. It's not my fault. <laughs> Look, you know, we can tell you right now that Benji's break even this week is 72. That, according to assistant coach, his break even likelihood, as in the likelihood of him achieving that, is 0.0% based on you know, his previous rounds of form. Now, his projection is 18. Now, I honestly think he's going to do better than that. His average against the Rabbitohs is actually a 35. Um, and he's played them 10 times, so we know for a fact that, you know, this is this is some pretty good um, data to, to, to make that average on. You know, it's not like he's played them once and scored a 5. He's played them 10 times and scored 300. So we know that his average is 35. But even if he makes that 35, he's still going to drop by 20K. You know, and we, we can tell you that because we have all that data in front of us. And that's that's where the, the benefit of assistant coaches. Now... 
objective benefit of that is that next week we'll know what his break even is again and we can sit there and make a decision based on all the data in front of us is he going to make this break even hold off and how much is he going to drop by you know yeah. or do we grab him in now and it's the same in the opposite direction with cash cows you sit there and you can make those decisions going okay like we are Dane gay guy going okay he's got a break even of 40 he's not going to lose any oh, sorry he's not going to gain anything he might sit steady or he might drop Therefore, it's in our best interest to wait on him. Yep. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things. Like, you're looking at um, cash cows, you're looking at, like, guys like Buchanan. Look at their break evens of 32, I think, for Buchanan, or 31. What's your lock of making it? Will they make cash? Will they lose cash for stuff? And also, how does he work into your buys, when you, especially when you talking about Sam Repair? Yeah, he missed last week. Do you trade him out? Do you take 100 k or do you hold him on for another three weeks and get that first buy run out of the way and then trade them. That's, I mean, that's that's exactly right. It's, all that information needs to be taken out making decisions. Mm. Now, just having a look, how do we know if someone is a reverse cash cow or if they're just a dud? They had a fluke year. You know, maybe it was first year syndrome and they're now suffering second year syndrome. Um, you know, how do we go about that, Banksy? What are the key things to look in? You gotta look a, a for how this, you got to look at their name and how much they start at the start of the season. Like, you look at Benji, you look at Barber. Those are two mammals. They both start at roughly around 400k. They're both averaging 51 points last season. If you look at them this season, like Bar was averaging 23 and a half, and Bar Marshall was averaging 28 and a half. You got to realise, okay, how did they score their points last year? In Benji's case, he scored them through try assists, line break assists, kicking the ball, and doing that sort of stuff. Now he's been down a little bit on that sort of stuff, and I think if you look into the history of their stats, which you can get through assistant coach, you can see how they scored all last year and maybe the year before that as well. Or you can see what the averages per game were because it gives you the season total. So you can see what they've been doing and how they've sort of scored their points. And you can look at that, okay, they scored points by that. How they're doing this year, okay, they're doing, in Benji's case, he's not touching, the, he's not setting up all the tries again. He's a little bit injured too, and that's what that's the one thing you look at. Injuries are a key point. That's why Gagai's come cheap for as well. He had an injury in round two. He scored minus seven. He's dropped massively in price. Then you go look at guys like um, Gallon, who hasn't played after his one, I think it was. He'll be primed for the taking in about four or five weeks when he come, after, but three weeks after he comes back. Yeah, he scored one, Gallon. So you're going to be looking at him later on down the track when he'd be like 350k, knowing him. And yeah. that's a bargain for Gallon. And if nobody, if you're not going to jump, even if you, you ruin your buys, it's Gallon still. You know you're going to get 50 points from week in, week out, if not more. You're going to be taking it to the bank. It's, it's one of those guns you need in your team, especially at that price, everybody be jumping on them. Absolutely. You're nail on the head there. And you mentioned a little bit earlier too, Bank Sam, this is such a, when they do have that bad game, that couple of bad games, they stay in their price calculation and price move three rounds. So you know they're going to have higher than Reiki until that bad round drops off their three three round average. And that's something to take into account. You know, you might be sitting there wondering and saying, well, okay, how is it that you guys are able to sit there and say he's going to be good three rounds? And this is how we look at it. We sit there and go, okay, he's got, and, and actually let's let's look at Dane Gagai, okay? Yep. This week is the first week that his minus seven dropped off of his three round average, okay? So what that means is his average up until this game just now for those last three rounds was, and bear with me while I play with a quick calculator here to do it, because I'm not mass wise. So his average for those three rounds was 14.66 recur. Okay, so that's for the three rounds, round two, round seven, and round eight. Now in round two, he got injured. That's why he didn't play for five rounds. He got injured. That's why he had a minus seven. He had a couple of injuries, uh, uh, sorry, a couple of errors. One of those errors happened when he got injured. Um, you know, and it was very early on in the game. So that minus seven is not reflective of his skill level at all or his point scoring potential. He came back against the Titans, he only scored a 20. Well, okay, yeah, he only scored a 20, but he's coming back from injury. Against the Sharks, he scored a 31. Now that's getting back to sort of where Dane Gagai is. You've got to keep in mind, this guy started in the high throw. I think it's 392,000 or something. 350. There you go, 350 when he started last se uh, the season. this Because he averaged 43.67 at centre last year. Um... You know, and, and he is very, very solid there. Then he scored 17 against the Raiders. Now, he doesn't like playing the Raiders. You're always going to have a low score from him against the Raiders because of the style of play that, that Castle play and, and the Raiders play. You know, it's, a, it's just a poor match for centers like Dane Gagai. But that three-round average of 14.66 meant that he had all these price drops coming with these high break-evens and things like that. Now, his three-round average is 22.7. 
because that minus 7 has dropped off. And that's where his break even starting to come down, his price drops are starting to slow up. And we're starting to be able to say, okay, it's going to be this round, it might be next round, it could round after. We've just got to watch closely. Ready. That's one thing. Like People are saying, oh, he's scoring 20, 31, 17. He's good to win for try. Well, Gago is a try scorer. We know that from history. He's got, he's got a good try scoring record. You look at how he scored his points, okay. When he scored the 50, 46 at the start of the season against the Tigers, he scored two tries at 150 metres run, and he did a couple of tackles, did an offload, and uh, sorry, an offload, a couple of one-on-one -on -one tackles as well. When he, he's come back to see, uh, he's come back from his injury, he's doing twice as many, three times as many tackles, he's doing like 15 tackles a game, 10, 10 to 15 tackles a game, doing a few one-on-ones, he's doing a few tackle busts, and he's still running a good 100 to 150 metres a game. He's breaking the line, breaking the line once. As he gets stronger and stronger, and more confident with himself, and once they start consolidating the half combination at night, so they keep changing it around through injury and through shuffling around with the team, once they get more solid, he'll be more solid, because when um, he was playing with Mullen and Roberts at the end of the last season, gunned it, he killed it. Now that I think they're named this week, Mullen and Roberts are named in the halves this week for the Knights. Yes, that's if right. If they can stay there, he can start hitting his 40s, 50s again, and you get him for 200, uh, 236k. Maybe you wait another week, you get him for 200, he might only score 30 this week. So you might get him for like 230k, 225k. Here's something you got to watch out for, it's like um, Barber is another one. You'll be, I think everybody's looking to jump on him this week. Every man and his dog is jumping on him this week, I'm pretty sure. Who wants a good, a, a very good wing fullback by player and a long-term keeper for a cheap price. And that's, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's, you know, looking at Barber, he's he's coming back from sorts of horrible bits and pieces that have happened with him, um, you know, and he, he pumped out a 40 point lane. Yeah, okay, there's a try in that. And there's a couple of line breaks and there's, you know, um, there's a try, there's a line break, there's a stack of tackle breaks, you know, which is just fantastic. That's, you see, and that's what I've been looking for. Personally, I've been waiting to see Benny Barber hitting five tackle busts in a game. Because when Benny Barber starts busting tackles, you know he's feeling good. Now, the interesting things, there's the five tackle busts, two offloads, he's got 90 metres run metres, there's a point for kick metres there, and yes, there's a try, but there's also that line break as well. And that's where you start to go, okay, Benny's starting to come back. He might not make his break even of 39 this week. He might drop that 11 grand. He might score 70 this week against the Knights. I'm not willing to 84. risk... Well, that's it. Like um, Ferguson did. Exactly. Exactly. I think. I'm not willing to wait until next week and miss out on those points for the sake of 10 grand. I'm jumping on him this week. By the way, I jumped on him two weeks ago. Yeah, I know you did. And you were cursing him. Cursing him last week. Well, when, when they when they, when, a, when the Bulldogs win 40 to 4, you expect Barber to score 40 points. He scored 16. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Interesting facts, though. Um... Benny Barber is only owned by 7.2% of sides thus far. Now, we're expecting that to change across the course of the round, um, but... That'll be close to 10 by the end of it. It'll be close to 10, but that's still good buying when you consider that 46% of teams own Greg Inglis. So, mm. you know, and, and Benny Barber's a player who can score like Greg Inglis can, you know, and, and he start... He was close higher than Inglis. He, that's right, absolutely. I'm pretty, pretty sure of it. But, um, Banksy, I, I think we've, we've now definitely covered off on reverse cash cows and probably talked to enough to confuse the hell out of people. It's uh, it's approaching that time of the hour, my friend, where it's time for us to close off the show. Is there anything else you'd like to bring up and, and touch on this week? I just want to say, if you're confused, ask questions. I'll be there to answer them to the best of my abilities. Jay will be there to ask, answer them to the best of your, his abilities, which is not that good, but hey, he'll, be still be, he'll be still giving you an ear. <laughs> yeah, look, absolutely. You know, Banksy and I, we love this stuff um we we love talking it we leave it we live it we eat it we drink it we breathe it and i'll i definitely have different views to banksy on a, a lot of things and, and a lot of angles to take um we've got raging debates happening in private message over who's going to origin and who's not at the moment but we're more than happy and always always welcome you know messages i know joel law and i've been chatting you know we we have a we touch base every couple of days to see what each other's doing and, and have a good chat about what the changes are and what we should and shouldn't do and what we're having and things like that and you know that sort of thing it, every person involved in that 
grows in their knowledge and increases their understanding of the dream team. Now, I look, I'm I'm ranked better than I've ever been ranked in my life, and, and I'm scoring better than I've ever done in my career, and I can directly attribute that to guys like Banksy and Butters and Gareth Lafsky and you know, everybody who's ever sat there and taken the time to talk with me and, and nut out an idea or just be a sounding board, chew out something with me. Um, regardless of whether or not you go that way, whether you take on board and go the way they're telling you to go or you go your own way, that's irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. The, the important part is the information and the extra getting. You see things that maybe see before. That can That's happen. definitely true. And as as we said, and Banksy said, you know, if if you're uh, if you don't have anyone else to talk to, come and talk to Banksy or I. We're always around somewhere, and um, you know, we'll always get back to you and reply and and, and give you as you know, unbiased information as we possibly can. And uh, always happy dream team. Thank you. All right, Banksy. Well, mate, thank you very much for staying up late again. At uh, Wow, must be nearly 1 a.m. there over in, in Kiwi land. Always appreciate your yeah, efforts, mate. Always appreciate it. No worries. And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the show. And good luck this round. We're coming into the buy rounds that you know obviously have dominated a lot of discussion in the lead up to. We're coming into state of origin. And uh, dear blue supports, as a, a mag Queensland supporter myself, I, I'd like to give you a present leading into this year's state of origin. I will admit openly, Greg Inglis should not have played for Queensland based on the eligibility rules that were initially set down. However, he did get cleared by the ARL at the time and therefore was legally allowed to play as a result of that special clearance. Um, but I will grant that he should have been playing for New South Wales on technicality. So I hope that gives you some peace and, and assages any sort of pain and heartache that, that has been going on. And, and I hope you all your lives and we go into a, a sensational series this year that will no doubt go down to the wire. Also, New South Wales. Last time I checked, Palmerston North is in the North Island of New Zealand, not in New South Wales. So don't claim Tamo. <laughs> what New South Wales name is called Tamo. That's a Maori name. He played uh... for New Zealand Maori. In 2008, he's a Maori. He's proud of his heritage. He just wanted to lose all the time. <laughs> oh, I love he's it. He's won the World Cup again this year, by the way, Aussies. Well, this you. Oh, look, I'm, I'm not even getting on that. I'm going to close the show up before this turns into World War Three. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen. It's always a pleasure doing the show for you. We love it, as you can probably tell, and uh, we hope that you certainly enjoy it. And we'll join you next week. Any DT questions in the meantime, anything you want to chat, hit Banksy and I up. We'd love to hear from you. Um, best of luck this week in, in Dream Team. We hope you score well.